Do you know your CPR from your DFS and your BFS from your JORK report? Well, we've got John Mayer with us now as a mining analyst at SP Angel who's going to uh, help us take it all apart and uh, explain what all these terms are within a mining report. So quite often as a mining investor you get through these long reports of what the company's doing, where it's doing it, how it's doing it, where it's going to make its money. And you come up against a lot of these terms. I'm very interested if we can to start off first of all we're talking about a competent person. You quite often see this in a report, a CPR. Explain a little bit about uh, what's going on with this. Well a competent person is somebody who is an authority in that particular area. Um, so it might be a, a mining engineer or a geologist who has done quite a lot of work within gold or tungsten or platinum. So you, you, you pick a, a competent person for a specific area that, that you want to report on. Uh, he'll be a certified engineer or, or will have um, uh, accreditation from some sort of regulatory body. Uh, and usually comes out of one of the consultancies, but not necessarily. Uh, competent persons often work within companies and sign off reports within the companies they work with, uh, particularly on the geological side of things, um, where they're signing off on um, not necessarily, not joke resources, because that should be more independent, but um, on, on uh, drilling programs and progress being made, that sort of thing. How about the independent? So with the, is it critical they are totally 100% independent? I mean, technically speaking, they're paid by the company, aren't they, to produce this report? Yes, exactly. And, and often on a press release you'll see that something has been signed off by a competent person. Um, I don't think uh, it's necessary that they have to be completely independent but they do need to be certified in some way. And If you're reading a, a CPR for a listing or for a fundraising or that sort of thing, then the, the competent person should be independent from the company mm. uh, and, you sh and, and money will be paid for that because for the work that is done. Uh, but for simple press releases, it's often a different matter. Yeah. You mentioned JORC report, J-O-R-C. Now this is something that's quite often seen in, in a mining report as well. What's that mean? What's that give the investor? Well, that definitely has to be done by, by somebody who is a, a competent person and, and independent. And that, there's a huge amount of work now into the new JORC 2012 reports uh, because the standard was upgraded, it, there were, it was tightened up to some degree. And now they have to do a lot more uh, feasibility study work to, to determine some of the economic parameters. There has to be metallurgical work done so that it's not just a project um, that might sit there and, and, and rot. It needs to be a project that has some form of economic potential to go further in its, in its lifespan. Mm. Feasibility studies are often undertaken by mining companies to assess whether or not there's any purpose, I guess, in going forward with, with this. And out of this comes the DFS, the Definitive Feasibility Study, and the Bankable Feasibility Study. Where, how do those two interact? And, and again, along what part of the process did they emerge? Well, there are various studies that are done, and they're given different names by different people, but you generally start off with a scoping study, then you, you go up to a pre-feasibility study, then you go to a feasibility study, which sometimes is called a definitive feasibility study, and that suggests that it's, if it's definitive, it should be the final word, and there's a huge amount of work done in that that can range from $5 million to $20 million, and, and, and more often with all the reports. There are many, many reports that will go into that. Now, a, a a report only becomes bankable in reality when a bank lends money against it. At that point, it is, it, you can say this is bankable because a bank has actually said OK to it. In reality, a, a DFS, a definitive feasibility study, should be the same as a BFS. But guess what? If it's not banked by anyone, how can you say it's bankable? So these, these terms are slightly loose, but if you go along to a, a, a well-known consultancy group, they will have a very strict series of reports that need to be pulled together and created by competent persons to create that, that BFS or DFS or, or, or feasibility study, whatever it might be. Does that give a project an economic quality, if you like? Uh, in other words, will we end up, after seeing all these reports, with something that says, yes, this mineral is in the ground, and yes, it is economic to get it out? Is that the stage where we get an economic viability of a project? A absolutely. It, 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 um, that should really tell you how much money you're going to make out of mining this project. And sure, there can be, there's often some optimization. Uh, we saw that recently with Kefi Minerals, where 
they had a project which had value but a very large capital cost and it's been re-optimized and reworked and for so for example they're going to mine it in a more specific way where they're, where they're going to get more high grade gold and less waste which means the plant can be smaller the capital cost is lower and so you can see how these things can change the optimization process can be Im incredibly valuable to, to these sorts of projects. And of course presumably the swings in the commodity price will ultimately, could ultimately make these reports um, invalid or the economic viability of a project becomes invalid if the price drops by a certain margin. When, when these reports are issued they always, almost always come with a matrix of valuations against various commodity prices and risk scenarios. Uh, so you should be able to see at what point this project is viable or, or not viable and in many cases it will depend on what your cost of capital is uh, and how quickly you might build it and, and how much capex you, you really need so there are there can be some gray areas but the best way of looking at these things is to look at the internal rate of return and if you've got something over 20 percent then it's pretty good and if it's not, that's not so good. And you want the, the net present value of the project at a reasonable discount rate, let's say something over 8% or, or above, to be uh, roughly around the cost of the capex, if not better, mm. if you see what I mean. So just general rules of thumb that are used in the industry, particularly used by people within the big mining companies, or, although sometimes they'll always break their own rules, we notice. <laughs> um, on from this point, then you want to start looking at ways in which you can raise money to, to, to develop the plant and so forth and, and, and go towards mining the, the mineral you're talking about. Then comes presumably the permitting, the environmental social impact assessment that we quite often see, the ESIA. And I can imagine that um, the, the, the faster the populations grow in certain areas, this is a very important part, isn't it? Because a mine can influence a whole society. Uh, in some areas. It, it's critical, yes, and, and you need to be mindful of the environment uh, and, and it, 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 it's, a, it's an obvious and simple procedure to, to ensure that you're not going to disrupt much uh, outside the immediate mining area, that any impact is minimized. It normally is a, a minimum two-year process, so you start the baseline studies pretty early on, um, usually when you're at the, the geological level. Uh, and you won't get a mining license in anywhere I know uh, unless you've done a proper environmental impact study. Now, these things can go on and on for years in, in some cases. Um, I know a project in the, the States, in Minnesota, I think the, the permitting process has been going for six or seven years now. Um, but in most cases, two years' work is enough, gives you enough baseline data to work on. Climate data, you need to know how much it's going to rain, how much water you will deal with for the tailings dams. Um, and what, what the effluent might be that comes out of the mine, how to treat that. Uh, so there's a lot of really obvious stuff that, that should be done anyway um, and is, is required for the permitting process. Mm. Um, one other um, a, a set of words that comes up sometimes is resource-based valuation. What comes out for an investor from this report? Well, I think one should be a little bit careful of this. It, it's generally used more in Canada and Australia than over, over here. Uh, it is a, it's a more of a general valuation based on the size and grade of a resource. It doesn't necessarily have much in the way of economic parameters. Uh, and, and, and for me and for most investors, we want to know how much is this project going to be worth at the end of the day. But when you're early on in the discovery of something, let's, let's say you have an old copper mine and you've done a series of channel samples within that, uh, you wouldn't have enough data to, to plan a mine off that but you could create a comparative valuation with other projects. So it might look really good, it might be really exciting and the sort of thing you want to, to put your money into, but it might not, you wouldn't have enough information to say, oh, it's going to be worth $100 million uh, when it comes into fruition in five years' time, for example. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just a, it's an early stage way of doing that valuation. Mm -hmm. I, I know talking to some investors, uh, there's some thought that perhaps maybe the geological industry is trying to hide behind a lot of these words but clearly there is a uh, there's a reason for all these sort of reports and the reason for uh, producing these to, in order to to make a, and give the um, validity for, for a mine. That's right. I, I would caution investors to be careful of what we call closeology. Mm -hmm. If somebody has a bit of moose pasture next to something else and then they try and give it a value without really much justification 
Uh, I think that's an easy way to lose money, frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, John, thanks so much indeed uh, there for that. Uh, John Mayer, mining analyst uh, at uh, SP Angel, uh, picking apart and explaining just what some of these mining terms mean.